שבוע טוב, אבי. We are in פרשת ראה, and בעזרת השם, we want to talk about today about a big topic that is very dominating and very big in our life, and that is called meat. And not to meat when you meet somebody, rather when the meat that you eat. And some people, their whole life is evolving around meat. And what are we eating? When are we eating? What are we having for lunch? What are we having for dinner? So, fortunately and unfortunately, I mean, I mean, food is a big part of our life. And for many people, meat is a, also a huge part of their life. Shouldn't be. But nevertheless, the Torah has a specific diet laws about meat. Why, what, when, who, how, how you slaughter, when you eat it, what you have to do. And uh, the main rule when it comes to meat is that we're not allowed to eat the blood. There's a lot of rules in Judaism about eating meat. In many other cultures, you just kill the animal and eat it. And uh, specifically in Judaism, there's a lot of rules how you kill the animal, how you have to uh, prepare the meat, and then how you eat it, what you're allowed to eat, what you're not allowed to eat, when the major rule is that you're not allowed to eat the blood. That's the major rule. Now, comes a big question is how, how does it make sense that the Torah allows me to eat the meat, but not the blood? So isn't the blood a big part of the meat? And uh, not only that, why, why specifically the blood? If I'm allowed to eat the meat, which er, as it is, I'm, uh, uh, I look like a carnivore. If you're really thinking about the process. Why would the Torah allow me to eat the meat, but not to eat the blood? And this is so important and so severe that the Torah repeats it five times that I'm not allowed to eat the blood. Now when the Torah repeats something, it's just to show you how strict it is and how severe it is. So there are five prohibitions in the Torah about eating the blood. Not one, not two. You know, many things in the Torah is repeated only once, is, is only said once. Some things are repeated three times, six times, twelve times, not to kill. Uh, observing of Shabbat is repeated a, long time, a lot of times. But specifically about eating blood, we find five prohibitions in the Torah. So if a person, chas v'shalom, eats blood, he's transgressing five prohibitions in the same time. Sometimes a person can do one act and he's doing one sin. Some person will do one act and it will be five sins at the same time. This is one of them. Because we're not allowed to eat blood. There are five prohibitions to that. And if chas v'shalom I eat blood, then in one shot I did five sins. Now, not only that, why, wh why am I not allowed to eat the blood? And only, not only that, is what's so important here? Obviously the Torah is going out of its way to tell me something that is so important by the fact that it's telling me not to, to eat the blood. Now, again, we are in Parashat Re'e and we are continuing, so to say, Moshe's will. If you remember, we spoke about it last week and the week before, the beginning of the book of Devarim, is Moshe knows that he's about to die, Moshe Rabbeinu, he knows he's not going into Eretz Israel, and he's, uh, so to say, giving a farewell speech. You can call it a farewell speech, you can call it a will, but if you listen to the Torah and you read it, you see that he's uh, kind of repeating the, almost the entire Torah. Yesterday we read out from the Torah on Shabbat, and all that the Torah is talking about is telling you, here you did this, here you did that, here you did this, here you did that. So... Moshe Rabbeinu is giving over his, <coughs> his will and suddenly he starts talking about meat. Why does he start talking about meat suddenly? Because for 40 years in the desert they didn't have meat. That was a new thing going into Israel. He says, you're about to go into Eretz Israel, and you're about to start eating meat. In the desert, who ate meat? They had man. They didn't have meat. They had man and they also had this bird. It's called Salav that the certain bird was a very fatty bird that it came down from, from the sky when they wanted to eat meat. And once in a blue moon we see in the Torah, in the 40 years in the desert, they ate meat. If they really, really wanted the, the actual meat. But nevertheless, they were eating a man the whole time. Suddenly, 
it's time to go into Eretz Yisrael. So Moshe Rabbeinu is start to talking about meat. Now, <clears throat> there are two verses in this parasha where Moshe Rabbeinu is talking about the meat. And the first verse, he says, the, the verse says, Ki Hashem irchivet gevulecha, Hashem is going to widen your, or broaden your borders. And, uh, and you have said, Ve'amarta ochla basar, and, I will, and you will say, now let me have meat. So we go into Eretz Israel, and uh, now there's no more man anymore, then we need to, to eat meat. That's what the, the, the Pasuk says. So the, continue, the, the, the verse continues, Kol nafshecha tochal basar, your entire nefesh will eat from the meat, but, there's a big but there, Vezavachta mi bikarcha o mitzonecha. But you have to uh, uh, slaughter the, the cattle and the, and the sheep, the sheep and the, uh, you know, all the other animals that are kosher. This verse can be found in this parasha, in the book of Devarim. This is chapter 12, verse 21. And this is the source in the Torah that we have to slaughter animals. Vezavachta mi bikarcha o mitzonecha. Zavachta means that you have to slaughter from your cattle and from your sheep and from your, uh, all the kosher animals. Because a lot of people ask, where do we have a source in the Torah for slaughtering animals? Everything has a source in the Torah. Sometimes it's a very clear source, sometimes the source is not so clear. Here it's pretty clear, it just says, you want to eat meat? No problem, you have to slaughter it first. But why the slaughtering? You know, in many cultures they don't slaughter the animal, they just shoot it. They shoot it, they kill it, whatever, whatever way. Judaism is the only, only faith, only culture that actually slaughters the animal but in a very particular way. It's not that you do whatever you want, you just stab the animal and it dies. It has to be so precise that if you miss one little detail, then the slaughtering is not kosher and the meat will not be kosher and you can't eat the meat. So what's the, what's the reason why do we slaughter the animal? So the answer our sages give is because it's the fastest way and the most painless way to kill the animal. Why? Because if you shoot it, not always it means that the animal will die on the spot. And if you do use any other method, it doesn't mean that the animal will die on the spot and then it will suffer. Or maybe the way you do it, it will experience pain. The way it's done in the slaughtering, it has to, to, to cut the main artery that delivers blood to the brain and if uh, it's done the right way, then the animal, it loses its uh, uh, consciousness. It loses consciousness on the spot because blood is not being transferred to the brain. And even though the animal is a little bit moving a little bit, but right away it dies. And it's the death that is the least pain and it actually says there's no pain to the animal. So the Torah is very considerate to the, to the animal and the Torah doesn't want the animal to have any pain. That's why we slaughter it. Now, <clears throat> you know, when you're really looking at the whole slaughtering thing, it doesn't look so, so nice and humane and, and a, lot of, a lot of organizations are going against the, the slaughtering. Really, it's the most uh, 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 nicest way to treat the animal. There's a, there's a story uh, said by a very big tzaddik from about 250 years ago. Uh, Rabbi Israel from Rojin. We learn here every day with the, with the men. We learn the teachings uh, of the Noam Elimelech from Elimelech from Lijansk. He was in the same, the same uh, uh, generation from the same yeshiva. There was one yeshiva that uh, whoever wanted to learn more on the Hasidic side that went there. The disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, the Magid from Mazrij, he had a yeshiva in Mazrij and everybody who wanted to learn Hasidut, he used to go there. So all these big famous names in the world of Hasidut, they used to go to the same yeshiva. Reb Zusha from Anipoli, and Elimelech from Lijansk, and uh, Levi Yitzchak from Bardichov, all these big names in the Hasidic world, they used to go to this yeshiva. And one of the students who was uh, known from is Israel from Rujin. Interestingly, they were named after where they came from. They, wasn't, they weren't named by their last name or something like that, rather where they're from. So Levi Yitzchak was from Bardichov, and Israel from Rujin, and Elimelech from Lijansk. So Moshe from Tel Aviv, and uh, Isaac from New York. And so that's how they were called. But nevertheless, uh, one of them was a very, 
great tzaddik, his name is Rabbi Israel, he was known as the, uh, Rabbi Israel from Rojin. And one time he came to a, a city, and who a big tzaddik coming to the city, they wanted to spoil him, they took him in, and right away, you know, how do you spoil a guest? You give him a nice meal. So there was uh, some meat on the plate, and he looked at the meat, and he was like, I want to see the shochet. Okay. Why you want to see him? I want to see the shochet. You know, in our days, you're asking for the certification. You're going into a restaurant, you, see, you ask, do you have a certification here? You have a, a kosher certification. They didn't have a kosher certification. He wanted to see the shochet. He goes to the shochet, he starts talking to him. And as he's talking to the shochet, a few people came and knocked on his door, some uh, maybe beggars or poor people, and he threw them out like in a very not nice way. Get out of here, I'm busy right now. So when Rabbi Israel came back to the place where they hosted him, he told them, listen, fire this shochet. He's not a good shochet. Okay, the, the big tzaddik said to fire the shochet. They fired the shochet. So the shochet came to him. The shochet is a slaughterer, the one who slaughters the animals. And he tell him, what do you have with me? Why are you so upset with me that you told him to, to fire me? Now I lost my uh, job. So he told him, because you are a cruel man. Cruel? Why are you saying that I'm cruel? He says, because how you dealt with these people, when they came to your door, how you threw them in such a way, I saw cruelty. I didn't see such a fine touch there. You, you would think that you would deal with these people in a very nice way. But you like threw them out. So, so the Shochet says, so what's the big deal? So he told him, you are working in a very cruel profession. You're killing all day long. So the minimum that I would expect is for you to have mercy on creatures. On, on whether it's an animal, whether it's a person. But since you're in such a cruel profession, so to say, all day long you're killing, all day long you have blood on your hand then I would expect from a shochet, a good shochet, to be a very merciful and a very uh, a gentle individual because the whole point of the shechita, of the slaughtering, is to, to be gentle with the animal and to have compassion to the animal and to make sure you're not slaughtering it because you want to have a, a hamburger. You're slaughtering the animal because you want it to die with no pain and you want it to, 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 to be elevated in the right way. So he says, and you, unfortunately, I saw, I didn't see any gentle, uh, anything gentle in you. You were very cruel to these people, so you're obviously also cruel to the animals, and I don't think you are worthy to be a shochet. So, if you don't mind... Sorry about that. So, in the beginning, the Torah didn't allow us to eat meat. Adam and Chava didn't eat meat. Only after Noah, we started eating meat. And when Mashiach is going to come, in a later stage of the redemption, we're also not going to eat meat. It's going to be again prohibited. In the beginning, we're still going to eat meat because of the sacrifices. But in a more advanced stage of the redemption, we're going to go back to being a... Uh, vegetarians. We're not, our body is not built to eat meat. So I know many people, their, their entire life is about meat. And if you tell them, 
that in the, the time of the redemption we're not going to be eat meat. No, no, so I don't want Mashiach to come or there's not going to be any more steaks. So, but here we see that the Torah gave us permission, we're allowed to eat meat, but there's a condition. In order to eat the meat, it has to be slaughtered. You can't just kill the animal, you can't just uh, pick a, a dead animal from the street. It has to uh, be slaughtered. Now, after that comes the third commandment, and, and it says, Rak chazak levilti echol adam. This is what the verse says. The translation is, is that you have to be strong not to eat the blood, for the blood is the soul. This is what the verse says. And again, this can be found in our parasha. It's chapter 12, verse 23. And this is the, first command, the third commandment. You have to be very strong not to want to eat the blood. Which is a, a very weird commandment. It basically tells me, you can eat the meat, but don't eat the blood. Now, what's the point of this commandment? Why would somebody want to eat the blood? I don't know any person that has the desire to eat blood. You have a desire to eat the steak, but not the blood. Why would the Torah go out of its way to tell me, okay, I'm allowing you to eat meat, uh, I'm uh, commanding you that you have to slaughter the animal, but third commandment in, the, in, the, in this uh, process, you're not allowed to eat the blood. And you have to be very, very strong not to have the passion to eat blood. Who wants to eat blood? It's disgusting. I don't know anybody that wants to eat blood. What's the, what's the, the point here? What's the, what's the, so to say, the, 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 the so, so important that the, the Torah tells you, no, but the blood, be very careful from the blood. I don't know m many people that want to eat the blood. Now, in order to understand why the Torah is so particular about specifically the blood, then we have to understand a little bit the background of how you kosher the meat. Then I'm sure that, uh, that uh, all of you, while you're in the kitchen, you're very particular about checking for blood. Now usually, when, where we would check for blood, then it would be when we have meat. But there's also another scenario that we check for blood, is when we make eggs. When you make eggs, you have to check the egg, that the egg doesn't have blood in it. Now I'm just going to tell you one side note, which is, which is important to know. But according to the Torah, the eggs that we are eating, there's no problem eating the, the blood in it. Because there are not eggs that come from a chicken that was fertilized by a male, by a rooster. There are, chick, there are eggs that are coming from a, a industrial uh, chickens. So there's no problem with the blood there. Because the way they do it now in our generation, I'm not talking about organic chickens that you got the egg from a, from a farm. I'm talking about the eggs that you buy in the supermarket. If you go and see how they make the eggs, this is not natural. They put all the chickens in cages, in unhumane uh, 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 conditions. They break their beaks, so they're not going to poke each other. And they're sitting like squashed in, in, a, in a box. And they keep the room heated. There's light all day long, there's 24 hours a day light. And the, in order for the chicken to lay an egg, it needs to be uh, stimulated by a rooster. That's how it works. If it's stimulated by a rooster, uh, then there's potential in the egg to bring a chicken. But if there's no rooster there, there's no potential even to bring even a chicken. They're just, it's an industrial way to bring eggs. Since there's no potential to bring a chicken in the egg, then even the blood that is found there, the whole point of the blood is when it brings life. If the blood is not going to bring life, meaning a, a chick, then there's no issue with the blood here. So the, the eggs that you buy in the supermarket that come from an industrial way of making the eggs, there's no problem with the blood here. We still check it. <clears throat> we check it from what's called marita ein. Marita ein means that somebody is looking. And not only that, maybe there is a chance that the egg did come from a, a farm. Even today, you'll buy eggs and it will say, from an organic farm. <laughs> Who says that it really came from an organic farm? But you believe what it says there? It costs exactly three cents to print on the box that it's organic farm. It doesn't mean anything. Unless you actually get the egg from a, a, a farm, that you know that the chickens are walking around there, you know, what they call it free range, and you know there's a rooster there, 
and the chickens get fertilized because of the rooster, then you know, oh, that's a real egg, a real egg with a potential to have a chick coming from the egg. That's the blood that you have to be aware of because the blood has the, the ability of bringing life. But the way they bring eggs now, uh, there's also a big question in halakha. I mean, now there are more questions coming up in halakha in regards to the kashrut, the, 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 the kosherness, so to say, of the animals. Because when they're being tortured before they're being slaughtered, there's a big question in halakha if they're even kosher to eat. Because an animal, if it's being tortured, right before it was uh, slaughtered, then my, most likely won't be kosher to be eaten. And I don't want to sidetrack uh, in this uh, class about that, but I spoke about it many times. I once gave an example. There's, it says in Halakha that if the, uh, the kosher bird, which can be a chicken, can be turkey, can be a duck, can be, there's many kosher birds. The, the Halakha, the Jewish law says that if you throw the bird from the height of a meter, which is about three foot, three and a half foot, and the bird didn't stop the fall with its wings, then it makes the bird not kosher. That's what the Halakha says. Now imagine now, go now to a, a plant where they transport the chickens, and you see they have chickens in crates. Forget about that, they're all stuffed in that crate, sometimes for a whole week, and they can't even move. That's, a, that's torture. You know not to torture animals. And if the animal was torture, there will be a question if it's even kosher to be eaten before it was even slaughtered. So they're all stuck there in the, those little crates. But then you see the men, they're taking the crate from the truck and they're throwing the crate down on the floor. Now if they're throwing it from a height that is above a meter, then the halakha tells you clearly that the bird is not kosher anymore. He didn't stop the, the fall with its wings. If the bird, I don't know if you ever saw, if you've ever been on a farm, chickens can fly. I mean, they don't fly so far and up, but they, they can fly. So if you throw the chicken from above and it flapped its wings and it landed, there's no problem. But it, if it didn't use its wings to stomp the land, then the Jewish law tells you the chicken is not kosher. Don't even slaughter it because it's not going to be kosher. So there's a very big question mark in the, in the majority of the meat in the industry if it's kosher or not. Same thing here with the eggs. We check for blood. But I can tell you already that if the egg was processed in, so to say, like a, it's not called a lab, but a, a not natural way how they make eggs, then the blood there, there's no issue from the Torah, Doraita, there's no, no issue to eating that blood even. So that's just as a side note that we need to know. But nevertheless, we still check it because this is one of the reasons it's called Marita Ein, that you see, somebody can look and say, hey, why are you eating the blood? Why are you not checking? And more than that, there is also a chance that maybe that egg uh, came from actually from a normal place. Uh, the chance is one to a million. But nevertheless, uh, going back to our topic with the meat, where we do, are we going to be cautious with, with blood is only going to be with meat. You're not going to be cautious with blood with other, other situations. Now, I don't know if you ever saw or did by yourself how you cash your meat, but that's not a simple uh, process. It's a very long process, and it's divided into to three stages. The first stage is called Shriya. This is when you take the meat and you put it into water for half an hour in a lukewarm water. This is the first stage. You, after you slaughter the animal, of course, after you take, took the skin off or the feathers or whatever it is, once you have the meat, you take uh, a pot or a or a pan or whatever it is, you take lukewarm water and you put the meat there for 30 minutes. What it does, it softens the meat. Then you take the meat out and you go to the next uh, process. The next process is called salting, melicha. You take a surface that is a little bit slanted and you put the meat, and you put salt underneath and salt on the top and the salt start pulling all the meat, all the, the blood out of the meat. Since the surface is slanted and all the blood slides down into one place where you collect the blood and you dispose it. And then you go to the next third stage and this is called Hadakha. You have to wash, Hadakha means to wash. You have to wash the meat three times. Three times to make sure all the blood came out. And all this is a pretty long process. This, just that 
can take a couple hours and they, they have to make sure that you're doing it right. All this to eat one piece of chicken. Now, the whole scenario here is only for one thing, not to eat the blood. It's only not to eat the blood. So, why is the Torah coming and telling me in the verse that we read, Rak Chazak, you should be very, very strong not to be tempted to eat the blood. Well, what's the, the, the whole thing behind it? I'm sure that if you make a survey now, you will find that most people don't have the desire to drink blood. Why is the Torah going out of its way to give me a commandment? You have to be very strong, hold yourself, that you're not going to be tempted to eat the blood. Technically, to most people, it seems like a very easy thing. What's the big deal? You have any, any passion to drink blood right now? Who has passion to do that? It's disgusting. But nevertheless, the, it's, even though for us it seems very, very simple, the Torah says, no, you have to be very, very strong. Why is the Torah telling me I have to be very strong not to be tempted to drink the blood? So we have two uh, 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 explanations for that. These two explanations are brought by Rashi, a commentator on the Torah. And he brings two explanations why the Torah is, is, is saying in a very uh, uh, strong statement to be very strong. The first explanation is an explanation by a sage, a Tana, that is called Ben Azai. Very famous Tana. I'm sure you heard about him a few times. And he's one of the four Tanaim that in the story of the Pardes, he was one of them. It was Rabbi Akiva. And Ben Azai was one of them. He's the one who looked in and died. Uh, I'll tell the story in a second. But nevertheless, this uh, Tana, Tana is a sage. He explained why is the Torah telling us that we have to be very strong about uh, being careful not to drink the, the blood. He says, yeah, it is a very simple thing that most people don't have the desire to drink blood. But because it's such a simple thing, the Torah wants to teach you that even a simple thing, even something that is so not uh, 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 powerful, then even that, I have to be very particular. Like even in a mitzvah that is uh, easy to do, that I have to be very particular and very cautious before I do it. But specifically Ben Azai, we have to understand who this person is. He's a sage, he was a student of Rabbi Akiva, and uh, he was very, very knowledgeable in halakha. He was a very uh, proficient and very deep in halakha. There's a story in the Talmud, in the tractate Brachot, almost at the end of the tractate, that it says that once there were two sages that were talking about all the rules and the laws of a bathroom. Believe it or not, there's a lot of laws in halakha about how to behave in the bathroom, how to get undressed, which direction to sit, what you're allowed to do there. There's, believe it or not, there's a, a whole section of laws. What do you do in the bathroom? Our bathrooms are now modern and nice. Uh, a few hundred years ago, and specifically 2,000 years ago, they didn't have bathrooms like that. They went to the field. So there's a lot of rules. Which direction you face, which direction is your back, how you have to do it. Nevertheless, in the tractate of Brachot, uh, it says at the end about a discussion between two sages and uh, talking about the rules of the bathroom. Or the more precise word I think to say was to, to say maybe say the laboratory or the toilet because the bathroom can be referring to a shower. Here it's referring to when the person goes and do, does their, their business. Nevertheless, then Ben Azai, this sage, came and he showed a lot of knowledge when it came to the rules of the bathroom, of the toilet. So they asked him, how do you know so many rules about the bathroom? So he told him, well, once I followed my Rebbe, I followed my Rabbi, who was Rabbi Akiva, and I followed him when he went to the bathroom. And I looked and I took all the notes. I was looking what he's doing, and I took all the notes and uh, to make sure. I wanted to see what my Rabbi does in the bathroom. I told him, what are you, bored? That's what you're going to do, you bow, you're following your rabbi into his bathroom to see what he's doing? I mean, I mean, well, you have nothing else better to do? He told him, excuse me, this is Torah and I have to learn. There's rules about how to conduct yourself in the bathroom. I have to learn from my rabbi, so I followed him into the toilet 
and I took notes. Just imagine him like, what are you doing there? <laughs> so, nevertheless, he says, no, his answer was, the answer is Torah, this is the Torah and I have to learn. I have to learn what to do. So I follow my rabbi. But nevertheless, this is the uh, famous uh, Ben Azai. The, the story with him is uh, that Rabbi Akiva, uh, everybody knows Rabbi Akiva, was one of the greatest sages in our history. And he was married to a very special woman. Her name was Rachel, who allowed him to learn for 24 years and she didn't even bother him for 24 years 12 years he went to learn in yeshiva she was the daughter of the Bill Gates of the generation Ben Kalba Savoa and uh, he was looking for her for uh, you know Prince Charles and then she brings this uh, shepherd that doesn't even know how to read and he disowned her he's like I don't want you to be uh, connected to me in any ways and they were extremely, extremely poor, Rabbi Akiva and Rachel. She said, go and learn Torah. For 12 years, she didn't see him. And when he came back after 12 years, he overheard a conversation between his wife and her friend. And her friend says, don't you mind that you didn't see your husband for 12 years? She says, if it was up to me, I would send him to another 12 years. So he heard that, he made a U-turn and he went again to another 12 years. They didn't see each other for 24 years. And when he came back after 24 years, needless to say, he came with 24,000 students, which is in our generation will be equivalent to 150,000 followers online. I don't know how to, to give the, the ratio. Now every little rabbi has already 5,000 followers online. So, but Rabbi Akiva had 24,000 students, serious students. Nevertheless, one of the dominating students was Ben Azai. And when it was time to marry off uh, Rabbi Akiva's daughter, then of course he wanted, uh, you know, the, the best of the best. He goes into the yeshiva and he starts looking around. Who's going to be the best uh, candidate for my daughter? So he finds Ben Azai. This is one of the top students. Okay, they go out on a few dates and they seem to like each other and they get engaged. Now in the olden days, it wasn't like today. Today you do the engagement and the wedding the same day. We, most people don't even notice what's going on. The, the engagement is called Irusin, and the, the wedding is called Kiddushin. Today in weddings what they do is the, you do the, kid, the Irusin in the, what they call the reception, the Kabbalat Panim. That's when the rabbi is signing the Ketubah and everybody's around the rabbi. That's the once, this is called Irusin, the engagement. And once, they used to do it a year before the wedding. And I believe it or not, there are some communities that they still do it. They do the Yerusin, the engagement, make a big party. That's when they sign the, the, the note. It's not the Ketubah, rather it's the, the name, it's the conditions. And then the bride and groom, they get separated for a year. That's how it was done originally. If you remember, where do we learn it from? When Eliezer came to take Rivka, then Rivka was a little girl, but nevertheless, she, she went back with Eliezer and when, they, when Eliezer says, can I take her, then Lavan at the time says, no, 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 let her sit here for a year, and after a year you come and take her. So from that, we learned that the, the bride, the, the, they used to do the, the engagement, and then a whole year they would wait. The bride would take her time, whatever, go to college, learn something, and, uh, but nevertheless, uh, some communities still do it. Not too long ago I was invited to a party like that, an engagement party, and they, they, it's a huge party. It's like almost like a wedding. That's when they sign the conditions, it's called name. That's it, and the bride and groom, goodbye, and they split. He goes to yeshiva, she goes to do whatever she needs to do, and only a year later they get married. So here, I mean now, yeah, Baruch Hashem, I have the, the, the schut. Now next week I'm going to a, a trip in the, in the U.S. Originally the trip in the summer was, I was supposed to go to Canada. But uh, there's a, a young couple uh, that they, they met in one of my lectures. And they, they invited me now, I'm in Los Angeles, I'm going to be officiating their wedding. They, they said, you know, you are Shadchan. I mean, we met in, the, in, in, in your lecture. I was like, I don't even know, I, I didn't even know that I did any shidduch here. 
But nevertheless, so, so they're like, we want you to come and officiate the wedding. So we were going through all the, all the details, what needs to be done, you have to prepare this, you have to prepare that. Now in our day, they, in our generation, the weddings, you do the Yerusin, the engagement, an hour before the wedding. And I'm sure you've been to many weddings and you see that in the Kabbalat Panim, the, you know, there's different words to that, the reception, the whatever, the, there's different names to it. The groom sits, the rabbi is there, there's witnesses there and they're signing documents. They're filling up the ketubah. They're also signing a document that is called the name, the conditions. And then they read it out loud. The mothers come, they break the plate. I'm sure you know the whole, say, the whole scene. Nevertheless, once it was done prior to the wedding. So in this story, Rabbi Akiva is looking for a husband for his daughter. And uh, he finds Ben Azai. He's like, this is the top student that I have here. One of the top students. And uh, they go on a few dates and they do a big party, an engagement party. And you can just imagine the engagement party of Rabbi Akiva's daughter. This is like the, the event of the millennium. They, they broadcast it live on Facebook and on uh, YouTube and uh, don't ask. Nevertheless, a few weeks, maybe a few days pass from this party. And Ben Azai comes to his future wife and he says, I want to call the thing off. What? After we did such a huge party, of course the bride is very, very upset. Why are you calling the wedding off? Well, is something wrong with me? So he tells her, no, it's, it's not you, it's me. That's where the sentence came from. You know, that's where the, the breakup uh, line came from. It's not you, it's me. So he told her, no, it's not you. Rather, he told her a famous uh, quote, Nafshi chashka Torah. My soul just desires the Torah. I don't want to be married. I have to go to, I have to take care of you. I might have to go and work. I have to spoil you, to buy you flowers, maybe massage your feet every now and then. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be bothered with a married life. Maybe kids. I want to just learn Torah all day long. All day long I want to learn Torah. And he called off the wedding and that's what he did. All his life he learned Torah. He didn't want to get married. And he told her, this is a famous quote in, in the oral Torah, Torah. My soul is, only has a, the passion for the Torah. Unfortunately, this is not what the Torah teaches us. And his end wasn't a good end. At the time when there were four sages that they went into the Pardes. Pardes is the acronym of the Pshat Remez Drash Sod. There were four rabbis that went into this, the realm of Kabbalah. He was one of them. The only one who came out uh, normal was Rabbi Akiva. Nichnas b'shalom v'yatsa b'shalom. Rabbi Akiva went in peace and went out in peace. But Ben Azai, he went in, he tzitz v'met, he died. So nevertheless, so he didn't end up uh, in a good place. But the story says that with him, that he was very, very uh, uh, learned, very into the Torah. But nevertheless, uh, he gives the explanation that about why is the Torah so particular about the blood because specifically because it's something very simple most people don't have the desire to eat blood or to drink blood it's a mitzvah that like who pays attention to it if you know if you really go through the list of the 613 mitzvot you would find mitzvot that that's a you don't do and even if it comes to your opportunity to do it's the easiest thing to do you ah, I'll do it like that but you still have to do it. So he says, no. The Torah, Torah wants to teach me that even simple mitzvot that seems to be very easy to do, even that you have to do. That's his explanation. The second explanation that Rashi gives, he says, you know, don't look in our generation. Look in the generation that when it was written. And he says at that time, there was a lot of uh, desire for blood. There was actually a very popular thing because they used to do a lot of uh, idol worship with blood. And they believed that if you eat the blood, you can start communicating with demons. And they, they, they believed that that gives them a lot of power. And at that time, the dafka was a very strong desire for blood. Now it's disgusting. But uh, we have to also relate with things that, uh, try to relate with things that happened 2,000, 3,000 years ago. We don't relate with idol worship. You tell people in our generation, idol worship, I don't have any desire to bow to an idol, to a piece of stone. We just read a few weeks ago about the type of idol worship that is called Baal Poor. 
I don't even describe what they used to do there, how disgusting it is. One can say, that's what people had the desire to do? Tell me uh, you have a desire for forbidden relations or a good uh, steak or money. Idol worship? We can't understand what, 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 was, so, what so, was so strong with idol worship. Our sages explain that the same way, take now in our generation a person that is addicted to the most severest drugs. This is nothing compared to how the, 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 the drive, what they wanted to do, idol worship. You can't even compare it. So the same thing with blood. Rashi says, yeah, many years ago, there was a very strong te'ava, a very strong desire for blood. Especially that it was involved in it idol worship. And they used to believe that when you drink the blood, and maybe it actually worked, then uh, you can c communicate with demons, and they had all sorts of different powers. But nevertheless, that's the two explanations that Rashi gives, why the Torah is so particular about uh, saying, don't eat the blood. So we have one explanation on one side because it's such an easy thing that the Torah wants to tell me even the easy things you have to focus on and another explanation that at the time it was a very strong desire for the blood. But there's another explanation that is a more uh, mystical, a more Kabbalistic approach to why is the Torah so particular about not eating the blood. Now to understand that I'll tell you a short story that the Baal Shem Tov had a custom that when he wanted to give over a certain uh, teachings to his students, he used to do something very unique. He used to put, gather, them, gather, gather them all together in a, in a shape of a ring and they would all put their hands on each other, like in a hugging position. Just imagine a bunch of men standing in a circle and they all have their hands around each other and he was part of the ring and he was able to take them into some type of a trance and elevate them to a spiritual level and to show them some type of a vision. So one time he did that, he took a bunch of his students and they all were putting hands around each other and he was able to elevate them into some spiritual trance and they saw a weird vision. They saw an ox, a big ox, but the ox was wearing a streimel the Shtraimel is, a, you know, those fairy hats that the Hasidim wear. And not only that, the ox was wearing a, a Hasidish uh, jacket. Some call it a frak, a sirtuk, a kapota. doesn't matter the names right now from, where, wherever, from where, wherever group they come from. But it looked like a Hasid, like a long, long, long coat, you know, those shiny coats. And a fairy hat, the Shtraimel, but the face of an ox. And they couldn't understand. And they're asking, what is this? Is this an ox? Is this a Hasid? What's going on here? So he told them, this is a Hasid that sat down for a meal to eat meat. But he was so immersed in the eating that he became an ox. He became the meat. He was so into the meat. And that's what he showed them. And he became an ox. He tra transformed himself to an ox. And he explains there that one of the biggest desires that we have is meat. I mean, we have many desires. We have desires for money, for fame, for whatever it is, nice clothes, fast cars, and for, of course, alcohol, drugs, and many other forbidden things. But one of the things as humans right now that we have a strong desire to is, is food, is meat. You know, now there's all these social networks. There's a social network where you put pictures on. It's called Instagram. And if you, if you look at that, I, Baruch Hashem, I'm, I, I'm not involved in that. Another, another pit of hell. But nevertheless, people take pictures of the food that they eat. They're in a restaurant and uh, they take different shots of the food, different angles. Why are you taking pictures of the food? Just eat it. And oh, right now I'm, uh, I went to that uh, restaurant. Ooh, you went to that? How did you get seats? Oh, well, I reserved it like 60 days ago. I remember when I was not observing, I lived in New York, there was some restaurant. You had to make reservations like three months in advance. Hey, you know, Peter Luger, Shem Rachem. Nevertheless, so what, people have such a, a, a tava for meat. 
and you go to a certain restaurant, you put it on your uh, Instagram, your Facebook, I'm eating right now in this place, wow, you're so lucky, and it's a piece of meat. Why are you making a whole big thing out of it? And we see that it's not only that, this is just one example. Some people around the, the food, the barbecue, the meal, it's all about the food. People get so fixed on the, on the, on the meal. Just eat the meal. Why do you have to make a whole party around it? Okay, I understand, the meat is tasty, you want to eat it, you maybe think it's healthy for whatever reason, all sorts of different opinions, I'm not going to get into the medical part of it, but never that, why are you making a whole uh, party around it? It's food. So, it's very interesting because in our, in our generation there are different types of cultures. One culture will tell you, listen, eat what you can, eat. live today because you're going to die tomorrow. That's more how a lot of people live, live by. Eat whatever you can, do whatever you can. Yeah, life is short, enjoy life, you know, tomorrow you might die, just eat today as much as you can. Stuff your mouth with as much as food as you can. This is one type of culture. There's another culture that will tell you, no, you have to refrain from all these uh, pleasures. Don't eat, uh, become like a, a, a monk, or, or I don't know all the terms that they use, but no. Don't enjoy life too much. It's a completely extreme opposite. But the beauty in Judaism, the Judaism tells you, no, you can eat. You can enjoy the meat. Just don't, don't eat the blood. The blood is representing the excitement. So you can eat the meat, but don't put so much excitement into it. There's nothing wrong with eating meat. Lefech, our sages say that uh, you want to pleasure the Shabbat and eat meat. You want to show a joy? Our sages say, en There's only joy in meat and in, and in wine. And on a, on a Yom Tov, on a festival, we, we eat meat. There's nothing wrong. You want to eat meat? Go ahead, eat meat. But don't make such a show around it. Don't eat the blood. Don't eat the excitement. That's what Judaism says. And that's the problem that most people, they, there's too much excitement around it. You know, there's a story that uh, there was a great tzaddik about 250 years ago, the Balatanya, and he had a group of Hasidim, very, very high-level tzaddikim, great, great Torah scholars, scholars. One of them was like a, a clown. His name is Shmuel Munkes. A lot of stories around him. He was like a, a jokester. And one time, the Malatanya comes to his, uh, his yeshiva and he sees Rabbi Shmuel Munkes is tied above the door. You know, there's a doorpost. He's tied on the top with ropes. Just imagine a man uh, above the doorpost, like tied, like on... He's like, what are you doing? What is this supposed to be? So Rabbi Shmuel Munkes tells him, if you walk next to a shoe store, then they put in front, in the front uh, window, all the shoes that they want to sell. And if you walk in front of a bakery, then in on the front uh, window, you put all the nice cakes. So here you're walking in front of a yeshiva of a great tzaddik, so what should be hanging is a chassid. So, so he was like a, a jokester. Anyways, the story is, this is a story that one time he walked into a, a Hasidic gathering where the men are sitting there for hours and learning Torah and getting excited from words of inspiration and they're drinking a lot of uh, alcohol, of course, all in Russia, freezing cold, they're every, every two seconds another Lechaim. Okay, so he walks in, this Shmuel Munkes at some point, and it was late at night, and out of nowhere comes a cook with a big pot of uh, uh, chunt or whatever, a big pot of meat, and he puts it in the middle of the table. And they all jumped on the pot with forks, sticking it into the, to the meat, all jumping on the pot. So Shmuel Munkus took the pot, ran out with it, and threw it to the, to the garbage. And all like, what are you, out of your mind? Well, why are you doing that? We're all starving here. This is good meat. He didn't say anything. Maybe an hour later, the cook runs in from the kitchen, screaming, Don't touch the pot! Don't touch it! It's not kosher! Don't touch the meat! 
And they're asking, what are you talking about? He's like, listen, there was some type of question here in the shechita, in the slaughtering, the meat is not kosher, don't eat it. And they're like, wow, Shmuel, Mr. Munkus, how did you know that the meat is not kosher? What, you have Ruach Kodesh? What, you such a high level individual? He says, no, I don't have Ruach Kodesh. I don't, uh, I'm not a prophet. But I just saw how you all jumped on the meat. And I understood from that, that's not human. This is not a behavior of a chassid. The jumping on the meat, the te'ava, the desire you had for the meat, showed me that the meat has not, can, cannot be kosher. Has to be something not kosher there, that you had such excitement to it, that I had to throw it away. So, the problem is in our, in our life, specifically if we want to focus on meat, there's too much excitement around it. And the Torah says, no problem, eat the meat. But don't go too overboard with it. Don't make a whole thing out of it. Don't open an Instagram account and start taking pictures of every restaurant that you're going, going to and showing all, uh, what you eat. Just eat it. Don't put all the excitement. And the thing is that the, the blood is part of the animal. And when I eat the, the, the blood, then I take a part of the animal and I eat it too. So first of all, I have to make sure that there's no blood there. But nevertheless, there is part, part of it in the animal. And when I eat the meat, it takes me down in my spiritual level. And I, when especially when I put all this excitement into it, it will affect me spiritually. It will bring me down from my level of spirituality. If you, were, if you look at the great, great Sadiqim, you know the Baba Sali ate twice a year meat. Twice a year. That's when he ate meat. Great Sadiqim, Arab Kaduri also is. I think he used to eat meat only in Sudam of Seket. Once, once a year. Great Sadiqim, you see, they eat meat, but a little bit. You don't have to eat all day long meat. Why? Because the meat is part of the animal, and it does bring you down in the spiritual level. And there is a direct connection between the blood of the, of the animal to my blood. Because when I eat, I digest the food, it becomes my blood. And when there's, too much, when there's blood of the animal in the meat, then it becomes part of me. And I become, uh, 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 I get this character trait of the animal. Exactly like with the story of the Baal Shem Tov. That the, the, he said the person was so into the meat, that he became an ox himself. That's the vision that he showed them. That he was wearing a streimel, he was wearing a, a coat. He looked like a chassid, but in the shape of an animal. So what's the conclusion for me? What do we want to take from that? Is that the secret behind Judaism and the beauty in the Torah is balance. You have to find the right balance in life. You can't be too extreme to one direction. And like I said before, with cultures, this is just stuff yourself, eat whatever you want, but you know, because you're gonna die tomorrow, just do whatever you want. This is too extreme to one side. And there's some cultures that they will go extreme to the other side. It says, no, you have to refrain from doing anything. And then people going and becoming completely extreme on the other side. Judaism, Judaism says, no, find a good balance. The whole point of the Torah, what the Torah is teaching you, is to find balance in your life. Not too extreme to one direction, and not too extreme to another direction. Here, we're talking about meat. But we have to understand that this is our entire life. Our entire life has to be balanced. Anything that I do, I can't be extreme to one direction. I have to be focused and I have to be balanced. If you're looking at the teachings of Kabbalah, you see that the whole teachings of Kabbalah is based on the teachings of the structure of the Ten Sefirot. And if you're looking at the structure of the Ten Sefirot, they are divided into three lines. That's how it's called in Kabbalah. Shlosha Kavim, Gimel Kavim. There's the right side, the left side, and the middle side. The middle side has two extra sfirot, if you're looking at the diagram. So the, there's an extra sfirah on the top, sfirah that is called keter, and another one on the bottom, malchut. This is showing the balance, that yeah, you do have two sides, the right side and the left side, but you constantly have to find the middle side, the balance, where your life is balanced. And the Torah is telling you, eat the meat, but stay human. Don't become an animal. There's nothing wrong with eating meat, but don't let it make you become an animal and get the character traits of the animals. And not to let the food drive you crazy. Don't let something so low control you. I mean, in the hierarchy of creation, there are inanimates, and then there's vegetation, and then there's an animal, and then there's a human. 
the human has to elevate all three levels beneath the inanimate, the vegetation, and the, and the animal. I can't let the level of the animal control me and put me under control. On the contrary, I have to be elevating the animal. So the message here, specifically of this halakha, is eat the animal, but say human. And the message in general that we want to take from that, that the blood that we are so warned here in this prohibition, be very strong not to eat the blood, the blood is representing the excitement. Now, there are certain things in this uh, world that are strictly forbidden. There is no question here. There are certain things in this world that are permitted. But there are certain things in this world that are permitted, but it doesn't mean that you have to overdo it. Overdo it. That's where the Torah comes and tells you, don't put excitement into things. I'm allowed to eat. The Torah doesn't prohibit me from eating. The Torah says, of course you can eat. But it doesn't mean that I have to eat 17 meals a day and all day long eat cookies and chocolates and milkshakes and cakes. And that's uh, it's not what the Torah is telling me. The Torah tells me eat for your health, eat for you to get energy, but don't overindulge on the food. Sanctify yourself with what you are permitted. And this is the main message here, is that let's do what the Torah allows you to do, but don't put too much excitement into it. Now here we're giving an example with food. It can be with many different things. You have to already think in your life, what in your life you are abusing the, the, the fact that the Torah is allowing you to do something. Why? Because our purpose is to elevate ourselves. And our purpose is to refine ourselves. And the more that I'm involved in physical things, then I can climb spiritually. If I want to be a spiritual person, I can't be involved too much with wor wor earthly and worldly things. I have to separate myself. But then again, the Torah tells me, don't be like a monk that you're not involved in this world. You have to find a very good balance. I have to know, here we're talking about food. You understand from it whatever is, is, a, is a right in your life. But even with food, most people, they don't have control over food. They, you put a plate of cookies in front of them. Some people eat one cookie. Some people put four cookies in the same time in their mouth. And then they eat like 17 cookies. You don't need 17 cookies. Eat one cookie with your cup of coffee. I understand. You want something sweet in your mouth. Don't go uh, overboard with that. The main message here is th that we have to be very particular with the, with the blood. And the blood is not necessarily the actual blood. It's rather the excitement that goes into things. And I have to make sure that if it's something that is a prohibition, don't have any excitement to do that. If it's something that is permitted by the Torah, do it. But don't put too much excitement that will cause you to do it over and over and over. And the way the Torah is saying that is, eat the meat, but don't become an animal. We have to remember that we are humans, we are spiritual humans, we want to refine ourselves, we want to grow spiritually. And I have to understand where I need to put my excitement, where I have to remove my excitement. And Bezrat Hashem, with that, it helps us grow spiritually and emotionally and physically and so forth. And that's our goal. Our goal is to refine ourselves and to, to, to climb to much higher levels. And Bezrat Hashem should apply that in our life and help us grow spiritually. And Bezrat Hashem should be successful in your, in your journey and everything that you do. And have a beautiful, restful, blessed week.